where music transcends boundaries. One Bay Area artist has consistently stood at the forefront of innovation and expression. On this episode of Music from Humans, I'm excited to converse with the illustrious Rent Romas, an Emmy-awarded maestro of the saxophone and multifaceted instrumentalist. Rent's artistic journey spans over three decades. Celebrated for his intense, ferocious saxophone performances, he's a pivotal figure deeply embedded in the fabric of West Coast creative music scene. Rent isn't just an improviser. He's a trailblazer leading groups like the Lords of Outland and the Life's Blood Ensemble and the Other World Ensemble. His music is a dynamic blend of genres from jazz to experimental, echoing his deep roots in Finnish heritage and American jazz. His collaborations read like a roll call of creative music pioneers. As a founder of Edgetone Records and Outsound Presents, Rent has been a pivotal figure in shaping independent music and nurturing a community of like-minded artists. Rent's exploration into his Finnish ancestry has led to the Other World Cycle, a suite marrying postmodern jazz with traditional Finnish music. The journey into the mythopoetic Finnish folklore has led to three other projects since then, all brought to life through his innovative musical lens. Join us as we delve into the world of composer-improviser Rent Romas, exploring his inspirations and his journey. What secrets will we uncover about his music? In this exclusive interview, we meet the man who not only played the notes, but who has significantly influenced the symphony of modern jazz. You know, Rent, I've known you for quite a while and listened to your music for quite a while, but this journey that you've been on um, let's say around the last 10 years um, with mm. the the suite of like four CDs you've released has really intrigued me uh, especially you. with all the uh, the Finnish relevance. I mean I don't know many Finnish composers or, or much about Finnish uh, music too much you know Sibelius and um, what is that uh, Radovara um, there's just you know I don't know too much and, and you're using all the folk melodies that so I'm real interested in it. I'd love to dive in and learn more about, um, you know, this journey you've been on the last 10 years. Right. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's really hard to pronounce most Finnish names. And so it's understandable how most folks don't remember too many Finnish composers unless they've been exposed to them over a long period of time. But Sibelius is one that most people know uh, because of, you know, the time he was in and the 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 moments that he and then the music he created and the moments he created in the and the um the you know he was loved and hated in his career his musical career um and so that you know that it was something to be to be remembered by in, in a lot of ways um but yeah uh, the uh, this this journey really started because uh, as a third generation. Finnish American, uh, where my family uh, escaped that space before it was ever Finland, um, running from poverty, um, Russian conscription at that time, uh, you know, uh, 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 famine. Some, you know, but they're all from my family's all from southern Ostrobotnia, the state of Ostrobotnia, in in uh, central North Finland, and. Uh, you know, I, I know that now. I didn't know that then when I started this journey. The whole idea was that I tried so many ways, reading, asking questions, documentaries, um, history, and none of it stuck with me. I couldn't, I wanted to understand what it meant to be, a, you know, have Finnish ancestry, have Finnish culture. And those a lot of those cultural elements were hidden away through body of memory and some minor memories of my mother's but mostly ripped away due to American consumerism. Um, you know, being forced to get rid of your language, your customs, um, even, you know, your spiritual practices, these things, and even names. I mean, names were shed, destroyed, in fact. And it's it's common amongst many people who have come out here from, from multiple generations far away. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to say now it's not nearly, not anywhere near that bad. Now people come here, they practice their own culture, they they keep their names, and people just going to have to learn it, you know. 
but a hundred and <laughs> some odd years ago, that wasn't the case. And so, um, I decided, um, finally, cause I had been dabbling, I had been, you know, I'd been reading some Sibelius music and dabbling in that. And I also read a lot. I'm an avid reader. Uh, I'm into mythology and his history and, and its relationship and a lot and old spirituality and things like that. And so there's a book called the Galevala and that is the considered the Finnish national epic. It's been compared to the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, scholars are still studying that today. It's a, it's, it was a book that was actually created in the 1840s from uh, a researcher who went out into what is known as Karelia, you know, and now um, half of it's now Russia, the other half is Finnish, uh, Finland. And um, there were, um, so there are what they call rune poems, and these rune poems were sung and they were learned by rote. And they had their own register, similar to Indian classical music. Uh, they were based on improvisation, but they were based on s specific storylines. And those stories were ordered by Dr. Elias Lonro in the 1840s to help to create a Finnish identity. Um, the Finns worked really hard to keep their identity through stories and song. It was their weapon of choice to, um, in, to uh, create their culture and to hold on to their cultural values while they were being occupied for almost a millennia by Swedish rulers, and then later about a hundred years worth of Russian um, um, occupation. So um, that those stories, like they basically they helped me. That's how I write my music. My music is mostly story based. I, you know, I started doing early things like reading Edgar Allan Poe and writing suites, Phil K. Dick. Um, uh, 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 the, all the Dune books, you know, I have an entire like two suites of Dune music, you know, all improvised, all composed, d st strings, horns, you know, all kinds of different stuff. Um, some are graphics and so that. So these stories are what in, in what inspires me. The word, the the concept. It's never been about the tone or the um uh or the chords or the scales or any of that. It's always been about what the story. And then I get these ideas and. They just sometimes come out of left field, out of nowhere, and I try to create thematic music. And so, long story short, using Kalevala and deciding that since I've had no success in understanding what Finnish culture is through the standard means of documentation and so forth, that music, which has always been uh, something that has given me my life and uh, and and showed me the path forward that it was the key to understanding my own culture. And lo and behold, the minute I started working on that and telling people what was going on, just magically in some way, synch synchronicity-wise, doors started flying open. I met Heike Koskinen. I, I met the entire Finnish and Finnish-American community. I found out there's a Finnish hall uh, in Berkeley, which was used to be part of Fintown. Um, and then, of course, started researching the music, went from Kalevala to the music. And that's that's the main thing right there. So it, yeah, that's really interesting. And, and it, for me, that's very like when I listen to these this body of work, these these recent things. I think technically, I think it spans all of your work, but your albums sound very epic. There's a there's a big arc to them. There's stories you've been creating all these suites and not necessarily operatic, but but epic like tone poem, epic y sight right. sounds and things. And yeah. Um, uh, and so that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, when you tell me that, you know, yeah, that's really so. Cool. Yeah, so that's you know that's the main thing right there. It's the that's how it all started, and that's how it continues to to move forward. Is is that there's always something new to learn. You know, you've got these big ensembles and really interesting sounds. You know, you've got two basses at times and two cellos and electric trumpet and very interesting percussion. One of the works, Journey to Manila, mm. has these big ensembles and these really interesting percussions and sounds. I mean, one of one of the beginning of that piece seems to have lots of wind and water sounds, and um, you know, I, uh, you're using some very interesting percussion and things. How I'm assuming your story is how you sure. is what mm -hmm. drove your um, yeah. Your your instrumentation and things, yeah. That that piece, I, I brought I brought this. I wanted to talk about this particular piece because it it, it encompassed the entire project. 
And at, when we talk and about you record it twice, you've recorded it twice on two different albums, right? Yes, in different in a different different, different configurations, group. right? Yeah. One is the American group, but and then we did Journey from Mon- from Manala uh, in Finland, but the other world ensemble. So there, so uh, Manala means underworld. And it was the second project. That the first project was about various stories in the Kalevala that inspired me, um, that still inspire me to this day about about perseverance, about strength, about um, you know uh, love, those all, you know um, those kind of um, things. Uh, that which is what you know Kalevala does. It it has like some mundane poems. It has some grand poems. But then really the whole thing is an entire shaman journey. That's really what it mm. is. But it was highly Christianized. Because Laurent needed to do that in order for the, a highly Christianized uh, a Lutheran finished population, which still practices the old ways, but very Lutheran, and mm-hmm. um, they needed something. So he kind of Christianized the stories a little bit, but you can't take out the shaman from the shaman's stories. It's not possible, and that's what I love about Kalevala is it truly is you know real shaman stories and. The, the main story, one of the main the main characters, Vandermeijen, who um, arguably some would say Tolkien modeled Gandalf after in the Lord of the Rings. Vandermeijen, Van um, you know, his power is song. His power, he can he can create and beauty and life through his song. He can destroy you through song. I mean, through the spells, through singing the ruined poems. And so there's a story. Where he is, he has to go to the northern lands in order to um, retrieve the mythical Sampo, which is the, uh, the, 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 I guess the life giving entity, force, stone, whatever. There's no real definition of Sampo. Anyway, uh, but to do that, he has to have a boat. And to build a boat, he needs to know the song so he can sing the boat into existence. And in order to do that, he needs to know the spell. Well, he, he forgets. He can't remember what the spell is. So he goes through this entire process, um, like a shaman, a shaman journey, which is you you to help those in your um, community. You you need to go to the underworld. But going to the underworld, uh, well, that's one way to, to know the spells. So he he thought he needs to go to the underworld, and that's what Journey to the Madalas really is about him getting to the underworld to try to find the spell to build the boat. And then getting out of the underworld, and that's the real danger. And in most shaman um, uh, shamanhood uh, uh, storylines and and experiences, uh, the journey uh, is the hero journey in general is very dangerous and can kill you actually if you're not careful. And so that's what this is. So it so it's so that's that's what that was the basis. So and he goes through the, a lot of different iterations of looking for this spell. And I actually in in the actual full album Manala, there are other songs that are actually related to that same story of him trying to find the spell through different means, you know, and going through different dangers. But Journey to Manala was one of the most profound ones where he uh, first he had to travel through all the various lands, and that that's part one. And part one is a graphic score. It's it's a, it's a very I mean, I'm not a graphic artist. So like, you know, I'm using pastels and I'm just like, here's the wind out of here and I'm taking a ruler and I made, here's the mouth. Something for musicians to actually understand. Not not for an artist, not for someone who knows art. They're going to see that and go, well, it's better than a five-year-old, you know. <laughs> right, right. But I'm trying to get the the context of the music and and it, I think it worked. I mean, everybody who was involved like understood like, okay, I divide the group up as it like an, it was an eight nine piece group. It's like okay, so I got the wins. I've got part one, and I got three parts in the part one. So it's like three and three, basically. So we're doing some magic numbers there, and uh, we have the wind that passes over the mountains. You have to get it through the normal land, and then you get to like this 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 kind of between world where the mountains start to look very odd and strange, and you're coming up on water because water is like the entry point because. In uh, getting to Manala, you have to go through the the the, the waters of the river of Tuane, uh, Tuanella, Tuanella, yeah, kind of like River Styx. Very interesting. <laughs> so, into the water, and then the third part is actually getting into Manala, like the entrance way, where the waters are black and dark. And actually, a lot of Finnish rivers are very, very, very black. It's, hmm. So it's so beautiful. There's a because it's 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 ice age. It's volcanic. It's you mm-hmm. know it's 
Yeah, a lot of very dark like stones. So the water tends to it's uh, on a bright sunny day on certain rivers. It's just it's jet black. So which is thus where all the mythology comes from. A lot of the mythology comes from actual like experiences of people who are seeing these things. And then there's the Denzians, and you have to get through all that. So that's like part one. And I decided instead of writing out the actual score music, I wanted everybody to improvise their feelings about this journey. And I would just like cue like we're going from one section to two sections and then into the, you know, and I think it worked really well. People were, the musicians got it, you know, um, and so it, it kind of gives that that element to it. And so, and so, so with your yeah. graphic score, how did how did you work with your musicians to go through the graphic score? Did you tell them the story and then um, to help make sense? Because again, like you said, graphic scores aren't supposed to be art; they're supposed to be uh, something that musicians interpret. And was there any other feedback or information that you passed on to people, or was it a little trial by error when you were first learning it? Well, yeah, I mean, I. So when I describe any piece, I actually tell these stories to mm -hmm. to the other musicians. So they they already get a feel for like what what we're trying to do. And I want, but I want them. I want them to to own this. I want them to put their own selves into this music. Uh, uh, that's kind of how I operate. It's it's it, you know um, that's the one thing. It's they're not. I don't want them to be technicians as much as I want them to be actually part of the composition. And so, which is why I, I chose the first part to be graphic score, because I just wanted pure intuition and working, listening to each other. And, you know, like when you, when you, t when you say to someone, I want you to play like the wind, it usually does a pretty good job, you know, of getting that across. Most people are, you know, that kind of thing. They're thinking, they're thinking the wind and they're thinking mountains. Well, that's a little more abstract, but it, you know, it can be like, you know, big sound, like, doo, 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 doo. you know, they can kind of, you can kind of get the feel for it. You know that kind of thing, but it's a brighter, sunny mountain, so it's not a, so heavy and I, that kind of thing. Um, and also the instrumentation I chose too. I mean, for that it was like you know I have my my regular core ensemble, which is basically jazz ensemble, saxophones, flutes, trumpets, percussion, and bass vibes. Um, but I also chose to have um, you know extended percussion and extended you know work. Uh, Cheryl Leonard, who's you know creates these entire worlds of out of natural found objects. I mean, beautiful, beautiful yeah. events. And then the infant Samas, who, you know, I think he's definitely on the path to shaman, but from my perspective, and he has all these incredible percussion and, you know, has his own projects and he's got, got the voice I was looking for for that project and that kind of thing. So bringing them in, they're peer improvisers and having them part of that. So everybody kind of had a different like perspective, but everybody like met in the middle. Yeah, I think the 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 instruments that they you brought in is is they're, they're truly amazing for this piece. Uh, and yep. and it, 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 the when I sit down and listen to to these works, um, that's one of the big pieces I I really enjoy is there's so many cool sounds and textures um, and unique uh, percussion instruments um, to just keep perking up your ear. Um, and helping to take you on your on this journey that you feel that you're on from from listening to it. Um, yeah, the it's I, I thought the instrumentation choices were were great uh, for 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 all of this. It's really nice. I was I was really happy with what people did, and I and a lot of times I do that. I kind of don't really know what's going to happen. I just kind of pick people based on my feeling and who and who I've met, and then I figure you know I think that's going to work, and I. I have to say, most of the time now, I'm not really, I'm not disappointed at all with the, mm. with the setup. You know, it's it's very, it's rare now. I, maybe just because, you know, you get to know people and you get to hear their music and then you start to like imagine what those combinations might sound like. So, And you find that's real important um, when you're working, uh, writing an, uh, a piece or composing a piece that's heavily improvised is is, mm -hmm. is finding the, the right people for that? Yes. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I really do curate the band, actually, before anything. I start writing. I, 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 I write for specific instrumentation. Now, you know, maybe some people, you know, some people I, I was hoping for can't make it, so I'll find someone else to fit that role. But I, I write for the, the group sound first, you know, um, with, with the caveat that things are going to... Yeah, Change is the most constant in the universe. So, and Heike and I have brought this music to Finland, and we have been challenged with anywhere from a trio 
to a 12 piece to a 15 piece right so we've started writing this music this music is also has a modular aspect to it but Originally, the uh, the first like what well, we did mono uh, here in the U.S. I wrote specifically with the background knowledge that it would be modularized at some point <laughs> from pre- our previous experiences. I think we've started to get really good at this too. <laughs> Both Aki and I, who, who have now co-wrote like the last two um, projects. Is there any specific techniques or thought you do to be able to to shrink it or, or modularize it like you're saying for, for different yeah articles. well there's basics right there's basics so what what can you sacrifice first of all that's the thing you, if you go from larger to the smaller what can you sacrifice well in my case i really don't care much i mean no offense but i don't care much about chords really i love chords and they're beautiful but sometimes they're also very limiting like they they constrict you into one place so i'm i'm not necessarily a, a, a chordal player and i don't mind if the chords disappear uh it's nice to have them let's put it that way nice to have and absolutely beautiful and i i'm really happy to work with chordal players but that's usually the, the first sacrifice is you're not going to get the wide, wide spread of the voicings happening so what's what's the basic melody what's got to happen what do people have to hear that's so i kind of triage to modularize you got to triage that and then well do we need the bass well not necessarily um you know, horns can play bass lines so you know uh but do we need some percussion not necessarily if we have a string player like it just depends on what like when when the when we took omarala to to finland we had no percussion at all there was no percussion so it was all the syncopation we had to do as horn players and bass the bass and the horns and the vocals i mean we we did it and it was a great challenge uh but then when we took this the new project which we'll talk about later it we yeah i was like no uh, we need percussive sounds for this project. So that was like prerequisite. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much what happens is like, what can uh, you remove without taking away the essence of the piece? Mm, the essence, right. Yeah. Cause you like your second movement has like a, a sort of a, it's kind of a great bass slide, And then, <laughs> then, then, then it's got like this, this funky kind of percussion yeah. on top of it. that just sort of settles a really bitch a groove right i i could see you know it's a pretty big difference when that part of the drum is done but the bass yeah. line itself is what what carries yeah. it right right and when we did that in finland which we had a three horn lineup and so and miko Inanen was playing baritone so he actually played the bass line on that that was required like the whole piece is centered around the bass. To be honest with you, a lot of my music is centered around the bass, bass line. Not necessarily the bass player. I love bass players; they're very busy. Um, but the <laughs> bass line is the such is the beginning of most of what I do. If I don't create the melody first, I'll create the bass line first. In this case, which is interesting, Journey to I mean Manala, Journey to Manala Part Two didn't I didn't start out to make it into kind of a a funk ish piece it just that bass like kind of manifest on its own by sheer mistake <laughs> <laughs> it's a great bass line i was just singing it today and, um and people have hard time playing it at first i have to actually sing it to them in order for it and it doesn't sound like it's hard but the way i wrote it, it looks a little off so people have to explain to them how to how to because it's because it's got to be funky it's got to be syncopated too so uh but yeah it, it, it it was, I was trying to do something else and then I, I flubbed up on some notes and then that thing came out and I hit the, I hit the play button and went, oh, I'm going to keep that. <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes things manifest on their own if you let them, which is really, really interesting when it happens. Cause you're like, oh, well, I guess I intended to write that, but that wasn't the original intent. Yeah, I mean, I, I love to to noodle around and improv on an idea and keep fiddling with it until I like, mm-hmm. oh, gee, I that's not what I really started out with, but yeah. that's better. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then and then from there came like it was easy for me to write the because the horns are kind of floating on top, and and then since that was based on the story of him being in Manila, um that's where i st- i wrote a libretto for that piece and and that that's something that i find 
really interesting that it's it, that came out of the actual story. The lines from that song are are improvised. So David Summers is improvising the words, like I well improvising how he's singing the words. Mm-hmm. I took the words from the story and I paraphrased, so it's you know understood. And then I gave him this paragraph and I said, I need you to sing this any way you want to within this, the, the funky elements that you're hearing behind you. And then we'll just keep playing this over and over again while you sing through it. And that's how it was born. You know, oh, that is a cool. certain, it's kind of Tom Waitsy, uh I don't know, it's hard to express, but I mean, there's definitely an element there how we approached, how we approached it. Um, and a, maybe even a little bit of a comic element to it, but that's you know that's fine because you know this I'm I'm kind of cheesy myself. Anyway. That movement's really pretty cool. People can really I think get get into the journey that one sort of feels like you're really moving through um, something, right? It's got the right because he's there. Pulse and that yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's right like, away. It's in now. He's in Madonna. Now he's like searching around and he's like trying to not be discovered at the same time. So. That's why it has that traveling feel to it. The third part then completely yeah, shifts around, and because he gets he gets caught, Venomaine gets caught by the the residents, and they discover he's not he's not dead. Because I mean, if you're in the underworld, you need to be dead. If you're not dead, then you need to be dead. That's the whole concept. So he, they he was being trapped. He got trapped. He got trapped, and so the entire third movement is him fighting the immense deathly sleep that's being perpetrated on him by the Denzians, by the people who, you know, the creatures, people, I mean, beings that live there. And um, having him having to use all, all his fortitude and his skills and his powers to fight that intense sleep and, and transform himself into... Um, um, well, so they, the thing about being trapped in the rivers of Manala, in the, the river of Tuanela, is uh, they use nets made of copper to keep you down, and you know on the on the ground on the floor of the the bed of the the river. And so, as a human, he was being you know kept down, but he was able to transform himself into an eel and get out of Manala that way through the power of his singing. The, the the funny part about this entire like set of stories is that he was looking for the spell to build a boat and he he didn't find it. That's the thing. oh no no he did not find the spell, and uh, he actually got it from from another um, ancient shaman figure in another in a, on another piece on that album, um, and <laughs> but I found the story so intriguing like the whole process of him going there getting there looking. Searching and then getting trapped, and then, then having to fight um, to to stay alive, um, that really re- for me reflected the true like the hero journey, uh, which yeah, yeah. you know we find in cultures across the world. That same kind of thing. Uh, it was and it was it was all documented right there, and so it was just so intriguing. And so the third piece really is kind of a dirge, but it's also like it also uses that pentameter, uh, rune style singing melodic melodies with overlapping. Um, uh, call and response voicings and then plenty of improvisation and um, but the whole idea is to feel as you, you uh, the idea is to make you feel like you, you are dredging forward and you you are fighting the, the, the fight of your life to, to, to survive there and I was trying to create that through that third piece so that's why it is kind of a dirge in it's, it's, in its process and a blues at the same time and uh, and and at a finished traditional uh, melodic pentatonic feel to it at this yeah so all of that was in there and um and at the end you hear it doesn't just end all of a sudden next thing you know it's it's birds bird sounds nature frogs that's so everybody has like okay and i had this little hummingbird thing i, I got and everyone had like you know it's like they were making all kinds of, that's the whole thing the ending is is that's the sa- the sound of the of being back into the the land of the living? Mm. Yeah, that's cool. So. And, it's, and they're the famous uh, one of the famous Finnish composers did did actually write a piece with taped bird songs and orchestra. So oh, yes, see, yeah, oh, yes, good Finnish yep. composing comfort company birds. <laughs> yes, yes, birds are. That's the second national pastime of Finland. Bird, bird what? <laughs>
just in general, birds. Yeah, birds and worry. I always say it, the two national pastimes of Finland, birds and worry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so I'm curious to, uh, so again, you kind of recorded this twice, uh, you know, you did, you played with two different bands. Um, is there anything mm -hmm. particular about um, uh, one version or the other that you liked better or... Um, I'm sure they're both they're both very magical in their own ways, but I was just mm -hmm. you know uh, wondering, um, you know, after all said and done, you have these two great things baked, but is there mm -hmm. there's some aspects that's oh you know that really came off better there or, um, mm -hmm. um, that's a that's a good question. It's like when I when I do a project or I write music, it it I kind of take this pragmatic approach to it where it's like that we did it at the moment we did it at and that's what it's that sounded like and then we do it with somebody else it's going to sound totally different it's going to be you know a different version their version uh different instrumentation different musicians different feel different i'm feeling different um so mm -hmm. so i don't you know for me it's like a progression so you know manala uh and then and then journey and then you know in journey from manala which is the the album after that to me, it was just like a progression of like, because we were also, we also, when we were in Finland, we got inspired to create the next project, Itquia. And that's, it was born out of that album. It was born out of that project. So mm. each record I do, each set of compositions I do is a stepping stone to the next iteration, the next project, the next part of my life, right? I mean, a lot of times, I mean, the music for me, music isn't, I don't just say music is life. Music is what keeps me alive literally yeah. no music yeah no romance i'm not gonna yeah i'm not i'm not gonna be here i agree i'm, I'm the same way and, I'm yeah the same way. right i mean we, we got to keep doing it or else we're we got to keep moving like like a shark or we're just gonna fall and die of suffocation and yep. and these things manifest and so the music becomes the manifestation of life and then life becomes the manifestation of music and that living entity just continues to grow and build and create and so, so, so journey from model is the second that that album needed to happen in order for me to get to the next project. And, but before model had to happen before other world cycle. And then I go back to all my other albums. And the funny thing is I hear the music now and I go, Hey, you know, I was already kind of experimenting with this concept. I just didn't know it. Mm. So, and then of course, you know, then I start getting into the weird, you know, maybe new agey, uh, spiritual side of things and say everything is very synchrono synchronicity oriented and like things happen for a reason. And that's, you know, the body of memory was there and it definitely existed and it helped me propel myself and get myself to even like using Kalevala to, you know, cause I had, you know, that's, a, that's the same kind of thing. I had to, I had to do these things on for Edgar Allan Poe and Lovecraft and Phil K. Dick and all these sci-fi writers, all these, these mythical stories in order to get to the Kalevala, in order to get to, you know, the music, in order to get to speaking with you. I mean, you know, it's all part of this ongoing process, which is fascinating and scary at the same time and, <laughs> and interesting and surprising. I mean, all the all the emotions are there, you know. So, I mean, I think a lot of musicians and artists, we can all identify with having this incredible, you know, mixed state all the time with what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. I'm no different than that. Definitely not. So Yeah, yeah. And and I and I, I agree. I'm uh on the um uh you're always trying to make it a, li a little different each time. I I've got several works that um, uh, the, my my purpose is strictly to do that. Right? It's it's like I don't want this thing to sound the same every time. It's yes, it's for right. symphony orchestra, but I want it to be different every single time it's played. So yeah. there's a reason to play it again. Otherwise, eh, that's right. Eh, we've recorded. It's been on the interview. Is there a reason to play it again? Well, maybe not, unless it's different or unique each time it's played. Exactly, and the, a lot of mod Finnish modern modern Finnish composers are doing that. In fact, they're actually even classical modern composers in across the globe are using elements like that of surprise and discovery and improvisation mm. and found sounds in their own comp compositional process, and you know, being played in symphony halls. It's, it's I find it fascinating and amazing and wonderful that that's been happening. Actually, yeah, I, I agree. I, I just I'm for me I'm I, I probably say this all the time, but I, I'm just super tickled to be in this time period because 
you really have the ability to pull from so many different areas, genres, you you know, rap or, yeah. or things and mix them together in the way that's unique for mm -hmm. you or means something to you. And right. uh, uh, you, you don't have to be a dogmatic thing yeah. like maybe in the 50s where it's like, hey, if you're not serial, you're 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 dead to us. Uh, you know, yeah. now it's like what what elements can you bring in or what what yep. can you mix together to create something new? Um, and I, yeah. I just love being in that mix. <laughs> and, and from a Finnish perspective, you know, that's what Sibelius was all about. He, that was just what got him a lot of criticism. He he mixed so many different things and genres in the classical world that it 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 caused quite a stir. <laughs> and yeah. he was pretty despised by a lot of his colleagues for doing that. Yeah, yeah. Of course, now everyone's like, oh, Sibelius. No, it's like, yeah, but, you know, there's a reason why he quit composing midlife. <laughs> Right, right, and, and that was my point. Like these, the those time periods were somewhat very restrictive for a composer mm -hmm. compared to yeah. what it is now. I mean, now, uh, you know, hey, some people still may pick you apart. They're like, well, I call it this. This is well, but it's not really that. Well, it, it's not that based on what it was fifty years ago. But Pretty. you know, we don't want it to be a museum piece. It's evolving, and so I'm pulling. Mm -hmm. I'm pulling from things that interest me. Um, anyway, I just think we're really lucky to be in the time period we are, to where that's uh, acceptable. Whether it's popular mm -hmm. or not, it's be a different story. Oh yeah, it's at least Absolutely. very, very acceptable. Absolutely, totally agree. Yep. Um, yeah, man. Thanks. Well, uh, I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Uh, I, I really Thank enjoyed you. it because uh, uh, learning more more than your liner notes and stuff told me about. Oh yeah, yeah. I've been listening to the last five six years. So you can never liner notes can never do it justice. Okay, Take it easy again. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, you bet.